given about 18 minutes to change your thinking, so I have to be brutally honest and hopefully very inspiring. So here goes. I've been involved in education all my life. I went from being the only Native child in my classroom to teaching in Native studies at universities for over 30 years. I did that all without a PhD, and it got me thinking that maybe it's not about our credentials, but it's about the quality of our thinking. So we're going to take a look at how can we improve the quality of thinking of Indigenous students today. For the last several years, though, I've begun to really question about what we're doing, taking a look at the theory and the strategy and the performance of Indigenous educators. Certainly, we've had a lot of success stories. A lot of, uh, of our people have done well within the academy. But some of our learners are not doing so well. In fact, seem to become harmed by the way things are going. And despite this area of reconciliation, many Indigenous students still can't quite achieve enough to stay within the academy. It seems like we've got two different cultures, and perhaps we're irreconcilable. We can never actually get along. We have a round dance, and you have a square dance, and maybe that's an indication of how different we are. It seems like we're trying to do the impossible. We're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole or a round peg into a square hole, and nothing seems to fit. So we're at a crossroads about what we should do. But one thing I've learned, no matter how many eagle feathers you put on a horse, it's still a horse. It won't be able to fly. And we have to think about that, that maybe by trying to indigenize the academy, we're trying to put a Band-Aid over something that is more serious. We have this great teaching about the first contact between my ancestors and the colonizers. At first, we had a big fight with the French. They didn't seem to want to be our allies. We grew tired of that fight, and when the Dutch came, we decided, let's make peace with them instead. So about 1613, we gathered together with the Dutch at the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson River, and we made a treaty that's uh, symbolized by this wampum belt called the Turo Wampum. It's an agreement that is symbolized by these two paths on the river of life. By this agreement, our ancestors, yours and mine, agreed that our relationship would be based upon peace, respect, and ongoing friendship. We agreed not to use violence to solve our difficulties. We would always use what we call the good mind. We said that we'd be able to tell each other apart by the way that we dress. On one path is the canoe of my ancestors. Inside that canoe are all of their laws, their beliefs, their tradition. And on the other path is the ship of the colonizers, which contains their laws, their beliefs, and all of their traditions. It was agreed in order to live together, in order to live in peace and enjoy the bounty of this land, we would respect the integrity of each vessel. We wouldn't try to steer each other's vessel, that we would remain equal partners. So our challenge today is, is this a model for Indigenous education? Is there something in this that we need to take a look at? Perhaps it's the space between the two rows where our programs actually reside. But all of these great uh, goals came crashing down as a result of the Indian Act and the Indian Residential School Experiment. We've all become familiar now with these legacies of these two uh, racist aspirations. In this 18th century drawing, we see Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, handing a book to a native man as he lays his tomahawk down. The whole idea was education from the Western perspective would pacify and tame the indigenous people. But in the 1970s, the native people seemed to have woken up from a big sleep. They started drawing lines in the ground and said, not one more inch are we going to give, or not one more child are we going to set into the system, that we're not, no longer going to be victims of colonization. So indigenous education uh, went to a big transformation. It was more culture, more language, uh, more community involvement, and uh, in many ways things are dramatically different than they are today. However, the dropout rate at all levels of school continued to be exceedingly high. Something's still not right. So for the last 30 years, we've been experimenting on our young adults. I've been experimenting on my own kids. What will work with them? What, what works best for our people? I'm trying to figure out how to keep them in school. The philosophy, belief, and practice of these schools comes from a long-standing tradition of education that's not from the indigenous canoe. And I suggest that maybe it'll never work because of that. Maybe it's time to change our thinking again. I would say that the idea of indigenizing the academy actually goes against the two-row wampum agreement. We're not supposed to try to steer their ship. They're not supposed to try to steer ours. The canoe cannot tell the schools what to do. And maybe the best thing we can do is stop sending our children over into the ship where they are further colonized.
before you freak out too much, I understand, though, there's some new realities that we have to take a look at. Whether we like it or not, your universities are entrusted with our children. We, we send them to you in the hope that uh, they'll survive the experience. And then the stability of our canoe has been seriously compromised by colonization. We can't simply stay, stop going to the university, stay in your community, stay in the canoe. We need to provide the next generation with new opportunities to understand how the canoe works and how an education system can help advance that canoeness. I think together we can fix this. So the greatest thing that I've learned about life has come from those people, those uh, who carry on the tradition, those who still had knowledge of the original people from the canoe. And despite colonization, they, they, they held that knowledge in their heart. They, it was part of their way of life. I became inspired by that, say, I want to be like that. They taught me that you can still navigate this river of life in the indigenous canoe. But they also said, you need to learn from the earth, from our elders, from our ceremonies. You, you need to learn from those sources of knowledge that aren't in schools. And you can't experience what it's like to be in the woods when you're sitting in a classroom. So they said that our life-fulfilling experiences are out there in the fields, in the, on the rivers, in the woods, in the cornfield, to within the ceremonies, and it has to be returned to a healthy home. So without that, we'll be betraying the legacy of our ancestors. This kind of experience is what I think... Uh, will lead to the next era of indigenous education. And it's about this transformation of the individual to this state of being. It's not about a dissertation. It's not about a publication. It's really not about being uh, within this context that has no understanding of these things that we're talking about. But I try to be hopeful, try to look hard, try to give you some real information, because I'm sure a lot of you have been working hard to indigenize your academy, and here I come along saying it's not going to work. So I had to think of four things that I think will work, four things in this transition towards this, this state that I'm talking about. So I'm calling them the four directions of reconciliation education. And the first is that we have to build local capacities within the indigenous community. In order to do that, we need to create indigenous educational endowments. We need, we need the money in order to build the infrastructure within our communities to bring that great talent to play uh, in the localities so that our people can learn in the comfort of being close to their home. They should, we shouldn't have to ship our kids off to the big cities in order for them to get an education. And certainly, if we support the local level where the languages thrive, where the, where the woods are, where the culture is, it will help to enhance their understanding of an indigenous worldview. Because ultimately, now what we know, we have to improve the image that our people have of themselves. Colonization has beat that down, and by supporting this local initiative, having the capacity to realize we can govern ourselves, we can manage our, our own affairs, we can be the kind of people we're intended to be. We have to invest in our youth, in our localities, and help them realize that sometimes the most significant things will never be found in the textbook. Second thing is we have to share this wisdom. I really believe now that mentoring, having a knowledgeable elder, a practitioner, working with a small group of uh, uh, eager learners, is more successful than this classroom education. We try to line people up, we try to sit in a square, we try to, to impart and pass knowledge on to them through technology. And what they really need is somebody who cares so much about them that they're willing to share their wisdom and understanding with them and to help them navigate their own lives based upon this inheritance that we have. So in the past, I see prior learning assessment as a good tool to understand that. Our, our learners bring something to the academy already. They're not empty vessels and it need to be filled. We need to recognize that that experience that they have, that collective experience, community experience, is very important on their pathway to being a, a better indigenous person. Uh, part three is to keep it local. Um, I know I said this before, but I think it's very important to realize that universities can have a major role to assist Aboriginal institutes not to tell us what to do, not to credential us uh, under your system, but to support our 
Aboriginal institutions like Six Nations Polytechnic or FNTI to help community people embrace their education and to thrive as a learner, knowing that Indigenous knowledge is the thing by which they can liberate themselves from their colonized past. It's very important to help them understand that. And you know, with the recent court decisions that have come out about institutional bias and uh, institutional racism, uh, whether it's uh, with uh, what happened recently with uh, the day school students or the child welfare thing, we really have to find a way to build our capacity to address these matters. And as we know, it's a very complicated thing. It's not just about getting a credential as a social worker, but finding a way to heal those wounds of colonization. And I think universities can help indigenous communities that are ready to move forward on this, not to direct them or lead them, but to stand in partnership with them. And lastly, I was at Syracuse University recently and uh, looking at their program called the Haudenosaunee Promise. Their concept is anybody who comes from Haudenosaunee community that meets their admissions standards will get a, a four-year uh, subsidy to attend Syracuse, a Division I school. They did this without the federal law requiring them to rethink their strategy, and I think it's very important. It's because they're in the middle of Haudenosaunee territory, and at Syracuse, they decided, what is it that we can do to assist our, our neighbors? So they offer free tuition. You still have to maintain your grades. You still have to go through that. But I think for those communities and families that are, are still feel that they want to send their kids to your places, we have to find a way to make it more affordable. There's a stereotype that we're taking care of from cradle to grave and that there's a lot of money available for indigenous education. And the reality is our people are competing for those few dollars that come here, the stress that's put on our students are filling out these applications and, and doing all of that kind of work. It's just been not helpful. So if you really want to have our people learn what your academy has to offer, we have to find a new economic relationship. So what I'm saying is, in the end, universities have capacity to generate more income, to organize your revenue in such a way that it can help indigenous communities achieve indigenous goals and still do it indigenously. You'll notice there's no PhD in indigenous knowledge. There's no colors associated with the degree granted to us. In fact, our elders say, you know, there is no such thing as an expert in our culture. There's just people who have practiced it, understand it well, and will impart information to you. But it's the collective, everybody's mind, which makes the culture work. But I think that we'll always be a subset of some Western thinking, anthropology or history or, or some other kind of category. Indigenous knowledge as it stands is still not recognized as a discipline, as something that is granted its own degree. So rather than make that fight, maybe we're beginning to realize it belongs in the canoe, not in the ship. As this picture shows us, indigenous people have come to understand the Western mind quite well. We know how it works. And we live the consequences of its failing. We have an obligation to help you reduce the harm on our children, but we also have an obligation to help you teach your children a little bit better about us. However, that saps energy from us. It takes us away from our primary mission, which is to help our young people be better indigenous people. So instead, we need to help our learners, our parents, our families, our children, and how they can develop their minds in a more indigenous way. So I see we're at this nexus, this where the river and the waterways begin to part. And maybe those paths uh, that are on that wampum belt are going to go in different directions. Uh, we have to regain the stability of our canoe, and so that education has to adjust accordingly. Our children need to see how the footsteps that they take now will lead to this productive future for themselves. And rather than fall in between the ship and the canoe or fail at a system that is not responsive to their needs, we need to think of them as the future of our communities, and we need strong generations of our people who carry that indigenous knowledge as their way of life, not just as a topic for a term paper or their dissertation. 
So thank you very much. I appreciate this uh, few moments that I've had with you. I hope to join you by uh, Skype. For those of you that want to talk more, I look forward to that. Yawa. Yeah, well.